Revelation, the second chapter, and continuing in uh, this section of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, which of course contain the letters to the seven churches. <clears throat> We're in the second church now, this morning. We've already done Ephesians, or the, the letter to the Ephesians that is given here at the beginning of the second chapter. So I'm not going to go over that or review any of that. I'm going to move you right over to Smyrna, the second letter. And we're talking about church conditions at the first century coming of Christ. What was the condition of the churches in particular at the time of the second coming of Christ in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed and Jesus taught us in Matthew 24 and the other Olivet Discourse passages that with the destruction of the temple that would be the earthly physical sign of his parousia, his arrival with a consequential presence. presence. Parousia, presence. And what is the condition of the church now? Morning, bros, sister, brothers and sister. In. I didn't see the Bernhagens come in. E easy for me to get distracted. Sometimes I feel like a little kid, you know, up here. What, what, what was the condition of the churches then in Asia Minor at this time? And why is it that, that some of them get, common, get a commendation and others get rebuke? In fact, five of them out of the seven get rebuked, which means... I'm coming, he says it five times to them, I'm coming back and certain things need to happen, otherwise you, the ones I'm talking to there in the first century, y'all going to be in trouble with me. And so there are some things that have to be changing here. And so it's going to be refreshing as we move into Smyrna's letter right here. The Smyrna is one of the churches that doesn't get a rebuke from the Lord. Five of them do, two do not. Here's the first one, and that's Smyrna. The second one is the Church of Philadelphia. And we'll see some similarities, by the way, between Smyrna and Philadelphia right away as we, as we get into this. So let's just read the text today. Chapter 2, starting at verse 8 down to verse 11. It says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation. And your poverty. But you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says to the churches. He overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. No rebuke. Commendation. They're in the midst of persecution. Guess who else is in the midst of persecution out of these seven letters? The Church of Philadelphia. There's two churches here that don't get rebukes. And they're both churches that are going through severe persecution. I'm telling you folks, not only is that a biblical fact, that is a historical fact over the last 2,000 years of the condition of the true church in the world. The true church in the world takes a stand for the Word of God, absolutely for the Word of God, and does not compromise over the Word of God. And consequently, the rest of the world, and that's how you find out who the world is, and they're usually in pews, the rest of the world begins the persecution, fascination, hard and heavy. And there is, a, there is a sense of swim or drown relative to a church that is persecuted. Now, I really have, I, I can't say much about this, honestly, because I've never been in a serious persecutorial situation. I mean, I've had people threaten me and stuff like that before. I mean, you know me, who, of course, first gets threatened, the mouth on that kid, you know, but... But the fact is, is that I don't have anybody burning down my house. I don't have anybody chasing me out of town. I don't have anybody, you know, looking to arrest me or anything like that. There's no, been no laws passed against us here, at least not yet. But throughout the history of the church, biblically and the history of the church, persecution has always been the lifeblood, if you will, of separating the wheat from the chaff, the true believer from those who just say words. See. And here, 
the condition at Smyrna is something we need to pay attention to. If you look at your outline, we'll go through this rapidly. We're going to look at verse 8, first of all, concerning the condition of Christ that is to be considered. Christ is going to be introducing himself in a certain way to the church that has direct revelation to that church and to that scenario. He's going to be introducing himself as one in this case who is the first and the last and was dead but is now alive. That's going to be important for this church to know in the midst of their persecution. Secondly, in verse 9, we'll look at the condition of their surroundings. Their surroundings being tribulation surroundings, poverty surroundings, those who are blaspheming them surroundings, but they are rich. And that's a part of their surrounding too. That overarches, that fact overarches over everything else that they're surrounded by. And then third, we'll consider in verse 10 the condition of their fears. And the condition is a command right from the Lord, don't be afraid. And then he tells them, don't be afraid of this. See, Christ will always tell you the truth. He won't smooth it over. He won't spread, you know, Betty Crocker's buttery cream, whatever, over the top of that thing so it goes down easy. He tells you, you're going to be cast into the prison by the devil. By the devil. How'd you like that? Get a message from the Lord. The devil's coming after you. So what? Devil's coming after you. Could be for a short time, 10 days. See? But he's coming. And here's the, here's the thing. Don't be afraid. Easy for you to say. Ah, but if you had prepped yourself in the word, that'd be easier for you to receive. When people continue to fear... When people, Christians, continue to fear, when Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says that Christ on the cross undid the authority of the fear of death that the devil had, took it away from him, and now Jesus is in charge of it, and he holds the keys to death and hell. See, when you've got that in your spirit, in your mind, and when that situation comes over which you should be afraid, most people, most normal people would be afraid, you'll stand out as a real believer in Christ walking in the exceptional vocation of no fear. And he says, in our fourth point, that there is finally a condition of what will not hurt them, and that has to do with the lake of fire. We'll have a few things to say about that. Let's consider that first point in verse 8 right there. The condition of Christ to be considered opens up this letter. Verse 8, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Of course, if you look at the top of verse 8, we've discussed this before. We'll just mention it every time we hit a letter because each letter opens up basically the same. It's addressed to the angel. And I've told you and given you my reasons before why I believe the agalos, the Greek word there, for messenger, and is now writing this to the messenger of the church at Smyrna, the church at Philadelphia, the church at Ephesus, so on and so forth. I think this is a reference to either the lead or the teaching pastor uh, there in the church. One of the elders in particular that does the teaching. He needs to hear this first. He needs to hear this address to him. And, it, and the reader there in the church, as they would receive this, uh, uh, this letter, this cover letter, along with the rest of this epistle of Revelation, would read it out loud, read it out loud, inclu including this letter to the messenger. That holds the messenger, the teaching pastor, accountable for what Christ is saying to him. And what he wants him to know about, what he wants him to engender uh, in the lives of the people of the church. And that will include the good stuff as well as the rebuke stuff. This church receives no rebuke. I say the messenger is doing his job. And he says, to the messenger then of the church in Smyrna, write this. The Smyrna, the word Smyrna means myrrh, myrrh. And uh, it's a type of uh, pungent anointing oil that was largely used uh, in funeral uh, processes. It was for anointing dead bodies. And you know why. Because the, they stink. Stink. That's S-T-E-E-N-K. They stink. Right? This stuff was pungent. But this says something, I think. I think the Holy Spirit wants to indicate that there's something here about the church of Smyrna relative to its effect on the dead. And I don't mean the physically dead. I mean those who are spiritually dead. 
It's like when a spiritually dead person smells that which is contrary to its death. And we get into that whole arena of 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, starting at verse 14, where it talks about the triumph that is in Christ and that beautiful odor that we, that we put off that draws the elect unto us and repels the non-elect as being something of death to them. But see, the, those at Smyrna had this. There's no rebuke going on to this church. To at least some degree, they're doing their job in grace. The, the city itself uh, today is, is modern Izmir in Turkey. Izmir. But it used to be called Smyrna. At this time in history, Smyrna was a center of, of science, scientific discovery, and a lot of medical uh, uh, advancements were taking place in Smyrna. It was also one of the uh, cities of Rome that was a main worship center for Caesar. Um, Smyrna, which you know what that means. Um, that means that every year the people of Smyrna had this incredible challenge. Every year the Romans, of course, would set up um, that, that idle procession unto Caesar and each citizen, each Roman citizen would be required to come and stand in line and take your, your spot and then burn that pinch of incense towards Caesar and say what? Caesar is Lord. And this is what got the Christians in trouble, see? Because there was only one Lord and it wasn't Caesar and they wouldn't say this. So much so that the early church father Polycarp uh, who was the pastor, by the way, of this Smyrna church. But he was the pastor several years after John wrote. Maybe 30, 40 years after John wrote. When he was 86 years old, this thing came through town. And he wouldn't bow to it. So what they did is they burned him alive, as an example. 86-year-old man. Oh, yeah. The Romans, man. Vicious. Now Christianity is an illicit religion at this point. A religio illicite. And this is what they do. There was also a large Jewish community here in Smyrna that also was hostile to the church. And that's why you see a reference here at the bottom of verse 9 to the synagogue of Satan. But let's not get ahead of ourselves too much. Middle of verse 8, Jesus says this about himself. This is what he wants the church at Smyrna to know. And guess what? This is what he wants you to know today. He says this about himself. I am the first and the last who was dead and has come to life. He calls himself essentially the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, God refers that to himself in Isaiah 46. He does it again in Isaiah 41. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus, when referring, making this reference to himself, is claiming divinity. He claims to be the Yehoah of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the book of Isaiah. And he says, that's who I am. I was dead. How could it be that this God could ever die? But he became a man so that he might die, so that we might live. I was dead, but death has no hold on me. Because he vanquished the power of death. Physical death as well as spiritual death. Spiritual death on our behalf. Van vanquished physical death for himself because death had no right to hold him. Satan, who had the power of death, was put down. He killed an innocent man. Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. We keep coming back to that. I think that's an important text for us to keep in mind. Hebrews 2, 14, 15. Good to read every day, I think. And so consequently, Jesus himself has the keys of hell and death. That means he has the authority uh, over it in particular. And he says, I was dead, but I have come to life. Death could not hold me. So what he wants to present himself, the one who is speaking to the Smyrnans, who were going through tribulation and were going to go through more tribulation. And he's going to, he tells them that straight out. Is he wanted them to know that the one who is on their side is the first and the last, the eternal one, the only God. There can be, you know, Rome, polytheistic situation, and they look to the Christians and they say, okay, only one God, you don't believe in other gods, then you're atheist. They believe the Christians were atheists. Obviously, you can't stay. And besides, you've got to remember, too, that Rome passed, remember Rome passed that law, the Senate passed that law that put a cap on recognizing any more gods. 
No more gods. And so here comes Jesus, and they begin to get the understanding. They're calling him God. No, you, you're, no, we're not doing this. And to make things worse, at least with all these other gods, the people could go on and just say, Caesar is Lord once a year, and then go on and worship their other gods. But with this Jesus God guy, it was like, no, I'm not burning it, and I'm not saying Caesar is Lord. So, I mean, this is throwing us all out of kilter. See, we can all, if we could all just get along. That's what Rome was saying. Can't we all just get along? Because if we could all just get along, hey, right? But there's a problem with that. And he wants them to know that because the first and the last is in their corner, that the one that was dead and has come to life, the one who has overcome death, that means, oh my gosh, that if I am in tribulation, I'm thrown into prison, I can be, like he's going to say down near in verse 10, I can be faithful unto death because he, my Savior, is in charge of death. So death is just a doorway now for the believer. Death ain't no thing. It's just a doorway now. It's what gets me to where I want to go. It's my goal attained. That's the means through which I arrive. So there is no fear. There's no fear. So he's saying, I'm the one who was killed. I'm alive forevermore. I'm the one who's saying this to you. Consider this condition of Christ. As we move into verse 9 and the second point, we have to consider the condition of Christ first so we can now consider the condition of their surroundings. He says in verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Now, if you're working with the King James Bible, um, you've got some extra words there at the beginning. I know your works. Um, not in the Greek, added much later. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that critical aspect of telling you how it got there or anything like that. That's going to come across quite often in the book of Revelation. book of Revelation has been tampered with quite a bit. And I'll point these things out as we're moving through it. But like I said to you from the very beginning, I'm not going to spend as much time in some of the critical areas that I've done in the past. If you want that, you can listen to another one of the, uh, the Revelation series. But in any case, that, that beginning thing of I know your works, not in John's Greek, Jesus never said that to him. Instead, he said, I know your tribulation and your, pro and your poverty. Uh, when he says, I know your tribulation, he's speaking of that which I know intimately. Not just a head knowledge. Not, I'm aware of your address and your dress size and, you know, the color of your eyes and your, you know, your favorite restaurant. These are things we know, right? But that's not what he's saying here. Is that I've got an intimate knowledge in regards to your tribulation. You, want, you know what that Greek word is, right? Philipsis, which is a, oh, nice. Thank you, sister. A pressing pressure. I'm intimately aware of that tribulation that you're under. Remember I told you? in regards to the, the status under Rome that this city was in and the requirement, right? And that there is a strong Jewish community that was there that had favor with Rome at the moment, but was hostile against Christians. Now, from AD 66 to 70, that, that favor with Rome that the Jews had, that's going away. And the tables are going to be turned, okay? And we'll see that come up, of course, because this book is all about uh, the end of the Old Covenant and the beginning of the New as the Old Covenant is destroyed, as it was typified in the temple situation right there. But in any case, he says, I am intimately aware of that tribulation, that pressing pressure. And I'm intimately aware and know your poverty. I know that you are in a position where it's not just a case of earning less, but you're so poverty-stricken, for instance, for instance, I was, just, I was watching Fox News yesterday, and they were talking about the level of poverty, how much it has raised up in our country, the poverty level. Do you, do you know that your pastor, you know, according to the IRS, is at poverty level? Now, I don't say that for any particular reason other than what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with give me more money. It has to do with the fact that I live very well, but I'm at poverty. They consider me poverty. Huh? But I own my own home. I own all my, my vehicles. You know, you can live at what, the, at what the government calls poverty level and just don't quit being a dummy about money. Stop being a dummy. You know what a dummy about money is? A dummy with money 
I, I speak of experience. A dummy with money is, is credit leverage to the hilt. That's a dummy. You, you, well, I couldn't help it. Well, I, okay, yes, I feel sorry for you, but nobody got you there but you. Applying for this, applying for that, signing on that. What are you doing? What are you doing? And this whole thing about, oh, let me say this real quick before I get too far off my subject. Okay. <laughs> this whole thing, you know, we hear it said to our young people when they're just getting out of high school, you know, you got to build up your credit. Got to build up your credit rating. I know you may disagree with me about this, but so what else is new? <clears throat> you got to build up your credit rating kind of thing. No, you don't. No, you don't. You know what you need to do? You need to lead, learn how to live by a budget. Learn to live by a budget, not by credit rating. Yeah, but what if you want to go buy a, You know you can buy a house without ever getting into all that? You can buy a house. Oh, but houses are so expensive. Who says you've got to buy a zillion dollar house? There's all kinds of opportunities out there that don't require some massive amount of me building up credit or something like that. There's always ways. Who do you serve? You serve the God of the impossible. You think it's a big deal for God to go, boom, there's a house for you. There you go. Here, color-coded keys, one for your wife, one for you. You think it's a big? You think it's a big deal for God? It ain't nothing. I know my language is atrocious. It ain't nothing for God to drop a mill on you, two, three, four, or anything like that. It's just that he doesn't want you turning into a jerk because people with lots of money end up being jerks. You know? They're sinful. I mean, the love of money truly is the root of all evil. Wow, it really brings it out of you. And all these people, oh, million dollar lottery kind of a thing. Man, that's evil magnified. Take all that money and give it away. Give it to me because I know where to put it. <laughs> what are you laughing at? What do you think, I'll keep it? <laughs> no, I have to stay at poverty level because that, I get preaching value out of that. He says, I am intimately acquainted with your tribulation and your poverty, but that's real poverty. See, they were losing their homes because they were Christians. They were losing their jobs. They were not being done business with, sold to, difficult, getting food on the table, real poverty, not this poverty here in the United States in the year 2013. We live like kings. Now, I'm intimately equated with that tribulation and poverty. And then it says, but you are rich. Because the riches that we have is not accounted for by uh, the amount in our bank account. It's not accounted in that way. It's a 2 Corinthians 8, 9 riches, isn't it? Just take you a second to look at it. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul talks to them about being in a state of riches that you can't get by earning power. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, our riches starts with the person. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sake, he became poor. What's that mean? That means that's a reference to Philippians 2, 5, and 6. That's the kenosis. That's the self-emptying. That's where Christ took all of his riches in glory that were his and his alone due to him as deity and emptied himself of all of his divine prerogatives and submitted himself under the will of the Father See, completely. The kenosis. And exchanged all of that so that he could take all of, of his riches and divide it up amongst an inheritance amongst all of his elect children. Everybody gets. So that for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. Rich. I mean, it just uh, like Tony's been doing here recently with Ephesians, the first chapter. Just going through the first chapter of Ephesians, there's the riches. There's the riches in glory. There's the absoluteness. 
And I don't mean riches just as an afterthought. I mean riches before the foundation of the world. I mean riches poured out on me not as an afterthought, but as a plan. You know that you were planned on. Some people talk about the fact that you know, well, you know, kid, you know, you weren't you weren't a planned baby. You know, you were kind of an accident kind of a thing. Nobody in there's no Christian, no believer alive at any time on the earth that was ever an afterthought. You were planned. You were foreknown by Him. That means. He he chose to have knowledge of you before the beginning of all creation and the beginning of all time. And then set up the system, predestining you, marking out the way, pro rezo, marking out the way to bring you to his son as an elect individual. Setting up history and all kinds of circumstances to get you to that specific point so that he might draw you through the hearing of the gospel. See? You're no afterthought. The riches that you have beyond anything that can be calculated in monetary value here on this earth. Back to Revelation 2 verse 9. He says, I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. Know what else he knows? Know what else he knows? He knows the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. There's another place here in these letters where this same phraseology is used. And it's over in chapter 3 and verse 9. And you will notice in chapter 3 and verse 9 that this is a part of the letter to the Philadelphia church. And the Philadelphia church had the same problem with those who are a part of a synagogue of Satan there blaspheming and persecuting them. And guess what? The Philadelphia church is this second church that doesn't receive a rebuke from Christ, but only receives commendation. I'm telling you, folks, there's a link between churches that are walking strongly and in the favor of the Lord and are under persecution. That means that they're probably bringing it on themselves. Yep. Persecution doesn't just fall out of the sky. Amen. Persecution is brought on. You bring it on by just being a believer, by refusing to compromise. You're the one. It's your problem. You're the flipping ridiculous problem. You're the reason that you're suffering. You are. You know, it's like after Christ saves you, you've got this mind of Christ, and all your decisions are based on that new nature. And it's not in accordance with what the world says. So the world says, you know, no, you know, all homosexuals, they're just like everybody else, you know, and well, look at all, aren't you watching all the TV shows that come out of Hollywood? They're just like everybody else, you know, and they have kids, you know, and, yeah, well, they don't actually have kids, but, you know, they sort of rent them out, kind of a routine, and that they need to be seen as, you know, just the same as anything else. But God says it's a horrifying, absolute, gutter-busting sin that's the antithesis of all that he created men to be and women to be relative to relationship. And it's a death penalty sin. Leviticus 20 and verse 13 says they are to be put to death. But we don't do that. We're not within that Israeli mosaic structure of law living in the land. We don't do that. Christ fulfilled the law. He can judge them himself. He'll do it himself. But who they are may, is maintained. Re Romans, the first chapter, very clear, very clear against this entire arena. And we bring it on ourselves. <clears throat> Why are these people blaspheming and saying that they are Jews but are not? Why does he say that this is a blasphemy? A blasphemia is injurious speech. We, we injure through our words. That's a blasphemia. Injure through our words. When these people were referring to themselves as Jews, but he says they're actually a synagogue of Satan. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood because I'm going to say something very direct and very, what some people would say is, is very harsh. And, and you know I'm, I'm very PC. You know that. And uh, so, I live for being PC. In this case, I have to back away from it. Uh, when he talks about the fact that these Jews were blaspheming because they were calling themselves Jews, this is in reference to ethnic Jews. There was a synagogue 
And there was a, a high-level Jewish community, like I said in the introduction, that was there in Smyrna. And they referred to themselves as Jews. But since Christ came and died on the cross and rose again, there's only one kind of Jew according to the New Testament. And that's the believer in Christ as the Messiah and the confessor of him as Lord. That's the only kind of Jew there is. And we see that consistently. I mean, you, you've gotten it a lot here uh, in this church. Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. You know that. That the true circumcision and the true Jew are those who are circumcised in heart and believe on the Lord Jesus. Philippians uh, 3 verses 2 and 3 says the, the same thing. Uh, Galatians 6, you've heard it from me many times. Uh, verse 15, verse 16 says the Israel of God are those who are creations or new creations in Christ. Like 2 Corinthians 5, 17 talks about. In fact, in Galatians 3, 29... It says that if you, a believer, if you're in Christ and belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The Jew, the Gentile, who believes in Christ is Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That land over there belongs to me. That land over there belongs to me and belongs to you. Nobody else has rights over it except you and me and our brothers and sisters. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. See? Part of the Abrahamic covenant has to do with land promise. You can read about it. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 17, 15 as well. Land promises. Now, I'm not saying let's go over there and raid it. Or I have no interest in being over there. You know, I'm just, at some point, I believe Scripture says at some point we will be over there. You know, well, maybe not in our, not in our lifetimes, I don't think. But in any case, the, the point being is that we are Abraham's seed. We are the true Jew. Now, Romans 9, verses 6 through 8 says the same thing. So in light of all of that, rather than having me, you know, take you over all these places, these people who say they are Jews but are, but are actually Christ deniers, they are actually blaspheming, they are using injurious speech. And he says that they're not Jews, but they're a synagogue of Satan. Um, this is not metaphor here. This is a reference to, well, it's, yes, it is metaphorical, excuse me. Uh, but this is in reference to actual people who are there, who are Jews, ethnic Jews, but are Christ rejectors, and they're there in Smyrna. They're also over there in Philadelphia, he says. And this synagogue that they have, it's of Satan. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, Hitler was wrong, okay? Do I really have to say this? Sometimes I do. Hitler was insane and was wrong. Uh, let God be judge. But you know what? Every synagogue is a synagogue of Satan because it stands in representation and in opposition to Christ the King. It stands in opposition to the very God that they claim that they worship. But Jesus made it clear in John's Gospel, you can't have, you can't have the Father and not have me. He who has the Father has me. You can't have the Father without me. I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. See? And it's satanic. So and I'm going to go on the record and be very clear here, and this is being recorded, and people are going to see it. Synagogues are satanic. I wonder if we can get that on the news. <laughs> we'll get some mileage out of that, right? <laughs> They're satanic. What do I mean by that? Do I, am I saying that they should be burned down? Absolutely not. I don't believe any physical harm should happen to them whatsoever. Absolutely not. No, 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 no. That's a crime. That's a sin against God. It's not for you to do. You know what needs to happen? What's the, what, what needs, how do you deal with, with Satanism? You bring the gospel to these people. You bring the power of the gospel. That's what Paul said in Romans 1.16. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and to the Gentile. That's how you get them out of the grip of that evil. So nobody misunderstands me, right? <laughs> I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich in the blasphemy who, of those who say they are Jews and are not, 
but are a synagogue of Satan. You see, according to John 8.44, John 8.44, where Jesus describes the fact that the devil was a liar from the beginning, and those, and he's talking to the Jews there uh, in front of him, and those who follow after him lie just like he lies, and they're of the devil. They're just like him. They don't know the truth. The truth is not in them. And that's what's happening here. When they say they are Jews, but they are not, they're demonically inspired and lying. Which brings us to the third point, which is the condition of the fears of the folks at Smyrna. He says, in light of all of this, do not fear, verse 10, what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. Now this is loaded, but let me see if I can, if I can stream load this a little bit. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Now, of course, the about to right there, that's our verb mellow. You recognize that even in English. And yes, the word suffer here in Greek uh, is in the infinitive mood. So that means that mellow is to be translated as about to, just like the New American Standard has right here. Do not hear, fear what you are about to suffer. It's about to take place. I mean, it'd be one thing if Jesus came to me, you know, right, or to you, and said, you know, well, there's something coming down the road here. It's a ways off, you know, you know. But we know how we tend to think. It's 20 years away. It's 30 years away. You know, when you're a young kid, you figure you're indestructible and you're going to live forever, you know, until you come around that corner and some guy's drunk and he wipes you out. And then you're off into eternity and you just turned 18, right? But you think you're indestructible at a point like that. So when people talk to you about dying, you're thinking, 40, 50, 60, 70, a billion years, you know, away. That's how we, we think when we're young because we don't have that sort of, um, that, that life experience sense of the shortness and the brevity of things, you know, and the importance of life. And so when he says, don't fear about what you are about to suffer, he's not pulling any punches, is he? He's not you know, warming it over and trying to make this comfortable. He's saying, you're about to suffer. And then he says how they're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Now, here's what I'd like to suggest to you. I bet some of you already see this. Take your pencil, go from the word devil, back up to the bottom of what? Verse 9, connected to synagogue of Satan. Because I think that's what he's talking about. I think that's what, that's my opinion on the matter, okay? You don't have to agree with it. You should, but you don't have to. <laughs> Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. Well, if the synagogue of Satan is something that was causing tribulation and blaspheme amongst those people, and the Jews at this time, they did have place in the governing aspects of Rome, Jesus is saying that they're directly connected then to them being cast into, the, into prison, into this tribulation that they're about to suffer. He says, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. You know why you don't need to be afraid of that? Oh, Hebrews 2.14. We should look at it. Hebrews 2.14 and 15. I'm there, so. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. He became human. That through death, physical, he might render powerless, katergeo, deactivate, him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So the devil's been rendered powerless. How has he been rendered powerless? How has he been deactivated? He no longer has the power over death. He means physical death right here. That, and that he might free those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. See, fear of death is a slavery issue. It's a slave. You're not your own. The devil who owns death is your master. Jesus comes along to break that and dies in our place, thereby rendering powerless the power of the devil in using death as a means of bringing fear and captivating us into that fear all of our lives and holding us there. So I don't fear death. I don't fear death. And I always say to you, 
It doesn't mean I don't want to be a minister of should. I don't mean, it doesn't mean I, don't want, I want to die or I don't care about that. Sure, I care about that. No walking out when I'm preaching. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. He says, I'll be back. Don't worry, buddy. <laughs> And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So I'm not a slave to that anymore. You're not a slave to that. So in light of that, back in Revelation 3.10, when he says, don't be afraid, the devil's about to cast some of you into prison, there's a very good reason they don't need to be afraid of that. You know, yeah, when, when people who have not been born again, and we know who we are, hear about being released from the fear of death, that can be a motivator that God would use to flip our switch and go, man, I am afraid of death, that person might say to themselves in a moment of, of deep honesty. I am afraid of death. And Jesus came to break the power of that. I don't want to be afraid of death anymore. And only Christ, only Christ can draw you to him for this, for anything. Only Christ. I mean, some people think, well, that's kind of an illegitimate reason to come to Christ. Uh, 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 any means that he chooses to use is a legitimate reason. Now, it's true, we have to be careful because there's a lot of illegitimate means that are used out there to bring people to Christ or bring people to salvation. There's a lot of illegitimate means. But I mean, if somebody is going, see, because that's not, that's not, listen to me, that's not natural, Adamic natural. It's not Adamic natural for someone to say, I don't want to be afraid of death anymore and run to God. That's not natural. That has to be drawn. Only God can do that. So if that happens, run with that. That's legitimate. Run with that. Run to him with that. And say to him, I don't want to be in this position where I'm afraid of death. I want you to, I want to know that you've taken death away from me and that I'm going to be forever with you. Because, by the way, if you're coming to him with, I just don't want to have any death, but I want to live any, any old way I please, then that's not a legitimate drawing that's taking place. That's just you wanting to get out of something that's uncomfortable. Oh, I'm sorry. I know I hurt somebody's feelings out there. Or made them mad. He says, the devil's about to cast some of you into prison. He tells them where they're going to go. How many people have been in prison? How many people have a record? Come on. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, I, and so it's like, now I never have, so I can't relate to any of you. But that can't be fun. That can't be good. He says, I'm throwing you into prison. Uh, it's not three squares and a cot or anything like that. This is Roman prison for Christians, which probably leads to death. Unclean, unsanitary, right? He's going to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, it says, and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Perazzo, tested. Tested, I, not so much tempted. I don't care for that word. I think test is a more accurate translation of perazzo. But you're going to be tested. Testing is part of the Christian life. Suffering relative to persecution is part of it. See, all those who are going to, Paul said to Peter, uh, to Timothy, all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Um, if you slip back to 1 Peter and the 4th chapter, you'll see what I mean. 1 Peter, 4th chapter. First verse, first two verses actually. He says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, in his body, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Say what? Say what, Peter? Arm yourselves with the same person. In other words, plan on suffering physically, he says to them. He who has, because he who has suffered in the flesh, in your body, has ceased from sin. I mean, it's pretty hard to fornicate when you're on the run for your life. Verse 2, why? 
so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, in the body, no longer for the lusts or desires of men, but for the will of God. That's the reason for it, Christian. That's why you suffer persecution. That's why sometimes it takes on a physical manifestation. It's so that you will live the rest of your time here on earth for the will of God exclusively. Yeah, but can't God just do that? I mean, can't, can't God just, look, Lord, I want to live for you. Like, he says, yes, I, I, I'm sure that you think you mean that right now, but let me, let me make sure it's real. You know, that's how he does it. Now, it's like, yeah, I know that's no fun, but that's, a, oh, by the way, uh, notice this word flesh for all of you. Remember how we've been talking about how flesh can be used in different places, sometimes for the Adamic fall of nature, sometimes it's in regards to the law of sin or the principle of sin, Romans 7.23, which is different from the Adamic fall of nature, and sometimes it's just a reference to the body. Well, here it's a reference to the body, and we get that from the context, okay? So sometimes it's used that way. Look down at verse 12. Verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. I can't believe this is happening to me. You know what they said about me just because I'm a Christian? That's great. You know why? He says, he says, but to the degree, verse 13, that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Look at this. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Oh, my gosh. Look at 17. For it is time for judgment in the first century, time for judgment to begin with a household of God. That's the church. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? The lake of fire. <clears throat> Verse 19, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God, so there's a will of God for suffering persecution, shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. By the way, this, this whole context here in 1 Peter 4, when it talks about suffering, it's talking about suffering persecution. It's not talking about suffering from a headache I can't ever get rid of. Or some disease or something like that. Jesus provided for that on the cross. That's not what this is. This is about persecution, okay? Right back to Revelation. And we'll wind this up. That's your first warning, you know, when I say that. We'll wind this up. Right, okay. All right, so they're going to get thrown into prison by the devil to be tested. Okay, they can rejoice in the glory of God. They're going to be doers of the will of God because of this testing, according to Peter, right? And you will have tribulation for 10 days, probably meaning just a short period of time. 10, as, as, as we have seen before in Revelation, and we'll see this time through, that the numbering system within the book of Revelation follows a Hebraic gematra type of numbering system. And so all of the numbers are symbolic. Just like Revelation 1.1 tells us how to interpret the book, that the contents of the book were signified, it says, Revelation 1.1, to John, signified to him. So all these things are to be understood in signs. When it says 10 here, the number 10 is used in, he in Hebrew, as the completed cycle of a thing. A completed cycle of a thing. And so basically, I think what he's saying here is that you will have tribulation for 10 days. That was the, uh, the completed cycle of that time of tribulation for those people, I think is what that means. He says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. See, be faithful unto death. In other words, he's not saying, he's not promising that they're going to live through it. He's not. But he is promising that there's a crown at the end. And he's already said, death, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. Now, death is a doorway to me. Death is a doorway to me, Jesus is saying. And so be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's the Stephanos crown in Greek. Stephanos. A Stephanos crown is the victor's crown. It's the victor's crown. It's used in several different passages. Have you write them down because I need to finish. 1 Corinthians 9.25, just write it down. 1 Corinthians 9.25 uses it. 2 Timothy 4.8. 2 Timothy 4.8. 1 Peter 5.4. 1 Peter 5.4. Oh, by the way, you can lose it. I didn't say you could lose your salvation. I said that there are, is this reward that is talked about as a Stephanos crown that can be lost. You can read about that in Revelation 3.11.
and also in 2 John 1.8. I'll let you look at it yourself. Revelation 3.11, 2 John 1.8 brings us to the fourth and final point, the condition of what will not hurt them. And that's found in verse 11. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to, to the churches. Excuse me. And it's emphatic and it's imperative in the Greek text. Akuo, for he who has an ear, let him hear. It means you better hear. You better listen. Yeah. If you've got an ear to hear, having an ear means I'm regenerate. And I have the Spirit of God in me. And so you better listen to this. So I, I guess we better. Let him hear, let him listen. What the Spirit, it's the Spirit speaking to the churches. It's not Casper the friendly ghost ridiculous thing. It's God's Spirit Speaking through the, all right, how is the Spirit speaking to the church of Pergamos right now? Through the written word of God. It's John, under Christ's direction and dictation, writing this epistle to the church. This is how the church is to listen to the Spirit. It's through the Word of God. That's what's happening right here. It's not through voices. It's not through dreams. It's not through prophesying. It's not through tongues. It's not through the interpretation of tongues, etc., 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 ad infinitum, ad nauseum. It's not through any of those things. And we're still in our, in our study in 1 Corinthians, of course, and we're... We're getting to the 13th chapter, and once again, I'll, I'll take you through Paul's definition, defining facts of uh, the purpose of uh, 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 the revelation gifts, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and why those things had to cease, had to cease. And he talks about it right there. But if you're prejudiced towards other things, like I got to have these things, you know, to, then you're not going to see it. As long, you know, prejudice, pr presuppositional thinking just destroys everything. That's the problem with everything in the church. That's what, that's the problem. That's why doctrine uh, is only gone as far and growth in the church has only gone as far as it has. 2,000 years, we should be blowing. You think the church is on schedule? I don't think the church is on Christ's schedule. Amen. I don't think so. I think that, 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 I think that I should stop getting off track. <laughs> he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. Now, by saying that, I, now I've got to say this. I don't, <laughs> by saying that, I'm not saying that he is not sovereign and in charge over what's going on. But there's this little issue about us. You know? You look, what is he saying right here? He's saying, if you've got an ear, then you better listen. Implying what? You might not. Hello? You might not, which means you might resist, which means you might miss out on this growing moment. And that's been our problem over the last 2,000 years. We've been so sidetracked. And the demonic has been working overtime in proposing a form of Christianity which has its leader, you know, ship uh, in the Roman Catholic system, uh, uh, has been proposing a form of small c... Uh, pseudo Christianity uh, that you know has basically sold itself to the world over the last two thousand years as the legitimate thing. It's amazing if you know anything about the history of the of the Catholic Church and how they are murderous and that they are soaked in blood and the blood of true Christians and the blood of entire continents of people. I mean, literal murder to advance their their propositions, political and otherwise. How could that thing still be in existence? Why would anybody consider, you know, the, and the Pope is treated like some rock star all over the world? Oh my gosh. If you knew anything about it, they'd have stopped that a long time ago. And those men, especially the, those in leadership positions, will be rotting in a prison somewhere on earth paying for their crimes before being rushed off into judgment before God. Calm down, Burks. Last promise. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. What's that Greek word for overcome? I think you know. Nikeo, which means to put your foot on the neck of the enemy. Foot on the, because that's what the conquering victor would do. That's what the Nikeo would do. He'd put his foot right on the neck of the enemy, indicating complete victory over that enemy. Well, they got some conquering here to do. They can plan on it. The devil, synagogue of Satan, so it's the Jews, are going to cast you into prison. 
How are you going to go? Like a conqueror. The suffering's in the will of God. Jesus just says it's coming. It's his will. It's coming. 1 Peter 4. We just read it. By suffering in the flesh, you, you get to bypass all the, gee, I wonder what the will of God is for my life. But people who suffer persecution that have to stand for the things of the faith, they get a benefit. They get a benefit. And that is an ability to ascertain and be in tune with the will of God for their lives. I don't know how to explain it. I'm just reading the text to you. And he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Well, according to Revelation 20, verse 14, the second death is the lake of fire. First death is the Adamic death. If that goes on uninterrupted in a person's life, then the second death will happen. And it's going before the great white throne judgment. And have you, do you, have, you don't have the righteousness of Christ, so let's check out your works and see if they're enough you know, to measure up to God's righteous standard. Oh, gee, I guess not. And one more check. Lamb's book of life, is, the, is his or her name written in it? No, his or her name isn't written in it. Lake of fire bound. Lake of fire bound. Raised up in this body, the Bible teaches. Raised up in this physical body and then chucked into the lake of fire. What does that mean? How, how, does that, how does that? I don't know. I'm just telling you what the text says. I know, what, I know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that there's some kind of annihilation. It doesn't mean that when your, your, your physical body gets physically burned up or something, that that's the end of that. I know it doesn't mean that because Matthew 25, verse 46, says that the sheep go into eternal life and the goats go into eternal punishment. That's a conscious state. Punishment is a conscious state. And it's forever. And Jesus expressed in his, his uh, telling of the story about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke the 16th chapter. And the rich man, he says, I am in torment in this flame. It's so bad, I'd like for you to send Lazarus. He still thought he could tell Lazarus what to do. Send Lazarus back so he can warn my brothers to not come to this place. And Abraham says what? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the word of God. What did the rich man say? No to the word of God. He said no to the word of God. The word of God won't do it. Send a ghost. Send an apparition. Paranormal freakout society. Send them. That will bring faith. You ever see any of these paranormal guys on TV ever come to faith in Christ because they see these spirits and stuff? They're seeing stuff. I guarantee it. They're seeing stuff. You ever see any of them come to faith? Not a one. You ever hear any of these so-called ghosts confess Christ? Not a one. And they never will. It's not your dead Aunt Rose. These guys that are talking this stuff, they're necromancing. They're talking to the dead. What, can't you read Deuteronomy 18? I can read Deuteronomy 18. Can you read Leviticus 26? I can read Leviticus 26. What about Isaiah 8, verses 8 through 10? Can you read that? Do you have any ability to read whatsoever? See, there's things in the Bible that don't require the mind of the Spirit to get. They're so on their face and so confronting. He says here, that you believers, you'll overcome because that's your nature now. They will overcome because this is their nature. This is who God created them to be. They are overcomers. Why? Because they're in Christ. The fact that they're going into prison shows that they are overcomers. And they will not be hurt by the second death. They will not be at the great white throne judgment, which results in the second death. What do we say about the church at Smyrna? How do we as a church, Messiah Church, 2013, August, how do we rate to this church? I got to tell you, I have a tough time. This is such a tribulation-oriented epistle, a tribulation-oriented church. And we clearly haven't been through it yet. But I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, that if you don't get ready to go through it, you won't be ready when it comes time to go through it. So what you're doing this morning is exactly what you should be doing. Not out of fear, out of gratitude. Because you're already an overcomer. You're in Christ. Have you read the last part of Romans, the 8th chapter lately? You're already in Christ. You're already an overcomer. You already are in victory in Him.
In fact, I'll end with that. He says, in verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? You tell me, will tribulation? Uh, let's all do this together like we are here and mean it. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation? No. Will distress? No. What about persecution? No. Famine? No. You sure? Yes. Yeah, good. The answer is yes. <laughs> Nakedness? No. Peril? No. Sword? No. Ah, but just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, and yet... 37, but in all these things, King James says, we are more than conquerors, New American Standard. We overwhelmingly conquer in and through him who love us. Upernekeo is, is actually the Greek word right here. It means to be uh, hyper-victorious. <laughs> hyper-victorious. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. In other words, when he says all these things, that when you are in tribulation, when you are in distress, when you are in persecution, in those things, that's when you overwhelmingly conquer. Why? Because it's conquering through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Father, we love you and praise you and worship you, Lord God, for the truths as you have given them to us today. How great and wondrous you are, how glorious you are, mighty King Jesus. We thank you for your present ruling and reigning power here on this earth. We thank you that you are conforming all things to your will and that your kingdom is growing and expanding. We praise you that your word says, Lord God, in Psalm 22, Psalm 86, and other places, Lord God, that all all the nations will come and worship before you and that you will do that Lord you are in the midst of doing that so bring it to pass O glorious father and may we be a people here at Omaha Nebraska in the year 2013 who overwhelmingly hyper conquer in all these tribulations and distresses and persecutions knowing Lord that when we are weak in ourselves we are strong in Christ Jesus how great thou art, holy, wonderful Father. We just ask, Lord God, that as we conclude the service now, Lord, with uh, taking up the offering, that you would be pleased with our giving, that we would give, Lord God, uh, as people not under duress or pressure, but, Lord God, as Paul taught us in 2 Corinthians uh, 7 and 8, that we give, Lord God, in accordance uh, with our means and uh, worship before you thereby. And so thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, for, um, uh, for supporting the ministry here, Lord, uh, in Omaha. Thank you, Lord, that the word goes forth and uh, brings forth fruit through these people, through your servants. In the name of Jesus, amen. Go ahead, Deacon Lynn. Praise the name of